Welcome to Brand Builders TV. Deep dive topics, tools, and resources brought to you by global thought leaders from within the Brand Builders Club. This show gives you access to the strategies that you can use to move forward with ease and flow in every area of your life and business. In today's show, Jean is going to be examining the game of midlife love. Learn it, model it, and get shit done. Let's go. Hello, this is Jean MacDonald, the Midlife Woman's Mentor. And today I'm going to talk to you about beating the odds in the game of midlife love. Now, before that, I want to go as a quick summary of the things that we have been talking about in the first two episodes. Because the first thing I was doing was um, talking about the midlife transition being a natural process. Some people call it a midlife crisis, and it can be, but uh, the more you know about it, the more you understand about it, the more you can prepare yourself for what lies ahead, the less of a crisis it needs to be, and more of the tradition tradition or transition um, that it should be. Now, the odds against midlife women finding a satisfactory um, relationship in later life get longer and longer for various reasons, which I shall go into in due course. But in my first talk, um, I talked about the midlife transition being rather like the transfer from a caterpillar to a butterfly. And um, and if you understand, if the, if the, if the uh, what would you call it when it's inside the chrysalis is inside a cocoon, uh, wakes up, wonder what's going on, very uncomfortable in this chrysalis. Uh, but if she knows what's happening or what's going to happen, then she would be reassured. In the second talk, I talked about the six areas which are most likely to hold midlife women in the chrysalis. And these are the sticky things which she has to shed as part of her process of emerging uh, ultimately as a beautiful butterfly. And uh, these were um, things like uh, health and health and wellness, money and uh, wealth, uh, financial freedom, that would be. The uh, next one is um, love partnerships, what I'm going to be talking more detail about now. And um, then we go on to self-confidence, self-esteem, and then friends and family, and finally, finding your purpose. So those six are the areas. Now, if we go on to um, the looking at all those areas, I can't claim to be an authority on all of those things, and so I bring in experts but um, who know a lot more about it and have a lot more experience than I have, even though I know the broad theory. What I do know about is relationships uh, between people in middle life and as you may remember i've talked about my book love sex and the midlife woman which i published in 2016 and since then i've been looking for ways that i can help midlife women understand and make their journey more easily so today um we're going to be looking at um love relationships that's that's really um <laughs> a euphemism for someone who you hope you've got a stable relationship you sleep in the same bed or at least they stay in the same house live in the same house and sometimes in the same bed um so it's to distinguish it from other relationships in your life so let's be honest about all this and i want to talk about the changing fortunes of men and women so one of the things that um uh, i talk about are the changing seasons of love so broadly there are three seasons of love firstly romantic love which all the songs are about and all the poems and all, all, all that lovely stuff. Uh, it's nice at the time, but unfortunately it has, doesn't last. It has a shelf life of a couple of years usually. Then we move into a longer haul called working love, which involves bringing up a family, setting up a home, developing a career. And that is by its very title, working. And then finally, once those things are done and have run their natural course, moving into the third area, which is mature love. And that's the area where I've specialized my interest in because I think there's a lot to learn. And it's very different from both the other two areas. And um, the big difference is that we have now become a complete person in our own right. As previously, we need a partner in order to feel complete. Now we pull it off to the extent that we are capable of being an independent being who can make your own choices. So, 
on this journey uh, through the um the the period which i call working love women will have had their disappointments and uh, found in some cases that love has not quite worked out um it could be that their partner um after many years of apparent stability has walked out or that the woman realizes that after many years of stability love has walked out either way she feels what i call a love deficit she doesn't have the love and women need a platform of love to support them in all the other activities that they undertake now it may need to be more um rational you see the thing about being sure love is we are no longer as impetuous or swept along by romance and hormones as we were in our youth and so we do have the ability to stop and take stock and decide if we are going in the right direction or not sometimes it's difficult but we can do it now what i've wanted to say is that um, um the fortunes of men and women are very different in middle and later life and let's start by looking at the men and these affect of course the odds on finding a suitable partner although as i've said with the right knowledge the right attitude uh, then you can do better than the odds so the first thing is there are less men than women in midlife because uh, unfortunately quite a few die in their 40s and i'm sure you won't have to look around hard to find examples of uh, men who died quite suddenly uh, often in their 40s so that reduces the number of available men then there's a second group um, who are um, really not suitable because they've got tangled up in all sorts of things like alcohol drugs or worse which make them um, a very bad bet as a potential partner the third thing i mentioned about them is that many of them have suffered uh, setbacks in their ability to return money so maybe the job or career that they were doing um, they uh, is gone out of date maybe they had what they thought was a secure job which then found suddenly they were made redundant and all of these things um, can lead to them suddenly not being um, able to support a family or even themselves others have gone on to um, uh, dissipate the money that they did have they had accumulated sometimes by having to run two families um, but one way or another a lot of midlife men, women a lot of midlife men end up without uh, much money and they're not always honest about it the other thing is that many men in middle life by the time they got to middle life are sick and tired and that makes them sick um, so many of them have potential lifetime maladies or and will make them invalids in their later years and you need to be aware of that because if you're looking at someone um, who's going to support you or provide equal love and support uh, you do have to take account that some of them just are not going to be able to do that and they'll want you to look after them i came across an expression in an american uh, an american site saying that a lot of midlife men are looking for a nurse with a purse so um and you will have heard me say in other things that uh, all the gold diggers these days tend to be middle-aged men on the other hand women are on the up firstly they're more employable um, because they have a lot of skills uh, which they acquired during their time of uh, running a career a household a husband all in one all, all the same time um, they're very versatile and very flexible and very willing so those skills also equip them if that's what they want to do to start a small business um, and many women do in fact that is a big trend across the planet women in middle life starting their own businesses because the goal is to become financially independent so you're not looking for a man to provide the money for you to live in your old age you provide it for yourself the second thing that women have got going for them in middle life is they've learned who they are and what they want often by the experience of not having what they want and not having the choices that they would have hoped for as a result of that it really toughens them up in knowing what they want and standing out for it the third thing is they're much better at networking and building alliances than men are you heard the expression men compete women cooperate well uh, these cooperative partnerships of which you see many of these days 
are a great boon for women because it means they no longer have to do everything on their own. And fourthly, um, once midlife women have cut through the, the, the uh, transformation, including the menopause, then they realize that they are tougher and healthier than they were in the youth often, but also than the men around them. And it's probed by the fact that they live longer. So for all those really reasons, women have reason to uh, rejoice. And I believe that um, they, they should take that into account and really start to uh, stand up for themselves. The other thing is a couple of other things I would mention about men. I'm not knocking men. I feel sorry for those who, who've fallen by the wayside. Not all have. But, um, you know, there are all these factors are unfortunately going the same way. But as men age, their characters also harden. When they were younger and uh, more uh, lively, they would often mask their character. Well, it may be it wasn't that obvious. But as they get older, they their underlying nature or temperament starts to assert itself. And the second thing is, as men lose testosterone, which they do produce less of it as they get older, most of them look for an easier life, which can make them lazy. So now you know the truth. See, let's go on and see how we can utilize that information to our advantage. How can I be certain, you might ask, before we go on about these things I'm saying about men and women, and also the things I'm going to be saying about the types of midlife men you're likely to encounter? Well, it just seems to fit the majority of midlife men who I encounter, not as potential partners, other people's partners, but uh, once you know what you're looking for, you see the same thing cropping up again and again. And the main thing to remember is uh, that you have a lot more going for men, so you no longer have to take pity on them or um, uh, be beholden to them in whatever condition you find them. So that power gives you so that gives you the power and independence to take your time in choosing or not choosing a partner. So my principal message to midlife women is in finding love from midlife men is you need to take control. But not in a masculine way, not doing what what men do, but instead using your feminine power, which in this day and age has been somewhat dismissed or discredited, but deserves to be revisited. Now, I've found the best way to represent the game of midlife love is with help from the game of chess. So you would no doubt notice what I have got behind me, which is a, um, a checkerboard, a large version of the chessboard, really. Uh, and I want to um, go use this and I need to look down here and say that um, uh, in chess, Along the back row, for those who remember playing chess, uh, or maybe you still play chess, the, there are four men, and uh, they're represented by the drawings up here. Uh, I'll come back to them individually, but you have the knight, the bishop, the uh, rook, and the king. Four men and uh, one woman, the queen. And the interesting thing about these men is they all do different things, and they're very pleased with what they do. But it, the interesting thing is the woman can do all of those and makes a lot less fuss about it. Does that sound familiar? Well, let's have a look at these individual characters. Now, I'm going to point as best I can. I'll give you a little more sight of the board behind me. Um, so, second one in is the, on that side. I No, it's on that side. Now, which way have I pointed? I've got to point that way. To go that way. There we go. Second along, my finger is just about on it. Yes, that's the knight, which is represented by a horse. And the reason is that knights rode horses in olden days. And uh, it's actually very um, helpful because the knight has certain characteristics. Um, yes, on the chessboard, as you will remember, his ability is very distinctive. Nobody else can move like he does, uh, even the queen, actually, because he can move two squares forward and one to the side. And he can do this in any direction, forwards, backwards, sideways. 
And that means he's potentially has many options and he likes it that way. He's a warrior and um, nimble and adroit. He has some clever tricks up his sleeve and that can be very useful. He's a bright, cheery fellow most of the time, but he's also inclined to get to uh, get depressed if things aren't going his way. He can be impetuous and he chases after his latest impulse and can be tripped up by his own cleverness. The positive features about the knight, he's likable and attractive. He's optimistic, willing, cheerful, uh, talented and ingenious. And um, the negative features is uh, he can be impetuous uh, in the pursuit of uh, the prospect of glory. It makes him foolhardy hardy at times. Overall, you could say he's clever, attractive, but unreliable. And he does not like to be stuck and unable to move, and he hates being bored. So my view about this is, is he um, is probably a better playmate than a long-term partner or a long-term reliable partner. Now, you gather that I'm reading some of this because I've extracted this from a course that I produced a year ago, two, two years ago, called How to Find Love in Middle Life with some help from the game of chess. So I wrote down fully the characteristics, but in the in the course, uh, How to Find Love course, uh, there's a lot more information about him, how he behaves, how he is when you meet him, how he gets so on when you stabilize in a relationship, hopefully, um, and how he ages. So all that information I've only I had to leave behind because there isn't time to cover all that detail. So let's go on to the next character. And that is the bishop who now that's that finger. No, no, it's that finger going that way. My finger is now on him. I hope you can see him. Um, but I'm I'm not able to show you the slides, which are part of the thing, which can show, of course, the full figure. So what about the bishop? Well, he's a politician and he spends a lot of time working things out in his head. The positive features are he's attractive, astute and can be charming and persuasive. He's usually very good with words and is a good negotiator. On the other hand, his negative side is he can be devious and scheming. He is attracted by power and money and usually manages to get some of both. He is a river that runs deep. His main motivation is to know what's going on. And once he does, to control others. He maneuvers to put others uh, under the influence or uh, under his influence by using his power. Interesting that he's a bishop, isn't it? Um, so he also likes to keep things to himself. He's secretive and he's suspicious of other people. He plays his cards close to his chest and is very careful not to reveal his weaknesses and keeps his defenses up. He's a good ally when it suits him, but he's also always watching the odds and may well be playing a double game. His power and money make him superficially attractive and he can use those to advantage to fascinate women, women even though he's, they know he's dangerous. They can even see that dangerousness as, as being attractive because he is a potential protector. Overall, you could say he is attractive, influential, but untrustworthy. So why would you get involved? Well, unfortunately for some women, he's a challenge. And he can be controlled with difficulty, but you have to have your wits about you and play the long game. So let's go on to the next one. The next one is the Rook. Now, where's he? Uh, I think I'm going to go this way. And I think he's at the far end. Yes, he is. I can see that. Far end. It's got my finger more or less on him. There's a thing over it. But you go that way. That's the Rook. And he's conveniently also known as a castle. So he has a headdress which looks like the turret of a castle. Now, what's he like? Well, He's a very straightforward and pleasant fellow. He's solid and reliable. Sounds good so far, doesn't it? On the board, he moves in straight lines and squares. He's a very good piece to use as a defender and a protector of you. The positive features are he's dependable, 
loyal and supportive. He can be friendly, open and easygoing. And he's often very skilled with his hands, good at DIY, enjoys working with machines and in intricacy. However, on the negative side, he can be unimaginative and predictable. He doesn't look ahead to plan or predict. And he lives for the moment as not particularly emotional or excitable. But he makes a stable partner. But once he's settled into middle life, he tends to specialize in doing a few things very well. They could become his exclusive preoccupations, and he's not keen on moving outside those. Overall, you could say he's solid and reliable, but comfortable and dull. But you could say, in every sense, he's square. So you can see the good and not so good. It depends on what you want. So now we come to the king. Now, where's the king? I think that he's there. Uh, that one. And um, what can we say about the king? Well, look at the game of chess. He's like a father figure to the queen. He's very fond of her, but he can't do much to help her because he can only move one square at a time. On the board, he can move in any direction, but only one square at a time. So he's invulnerable to being put in check. And for that reason, um, the queen has to keep a close eye on him because if he's trapped and cannot move out of check um, or be sacrificed by another sacrificing another piece, then checkmate and their side has lost the game. Positive features of a king is he's gentle, benign and wise in some areas. He encourages and supports the queen and he loves her and admires her. The negative features is he can be slow moving and that makes him vulnerable. He can be a bit of a dreamer and his attention is often dispersed. He has big dreams for the future, things he's going to do. Um, and he does make some progress towards them, but uh, <laughs> the queen may be irritated at the slowness of his progress. So many midlife women feel they'd like to have a king in their lives as a replacement for the father they either did have or they didn't have. However, kings are quite rare, and it's unusual to find a ready-made king available. Kings are usually cultivated over a period of time by a queen who has seen his potential to be a king in one of the other male pieces. Even if he's a widow, if he's a widower, the characteristic that made him a king for his former wife may not be a good fit for your needs. Overall, he will be a stable partner, but he requires a lot of maintenance and TLC. So those are the four pieces. I should mention briefly the pawns. You see pawns on either side of me. So the pawns, they are a collection of miscellaneous characters who are not contenders for the queen's serious um, attention. They think they are, but the queen doesn't. Um, but she uses them to advance her interests. And at times, she'll actually sacrifice them to advance those interests. Pawns are like friends of both sexes, discarded suitors, gay friends, children, relatives, and other people that the queen can use to hide behind or ask to perform favors. It's very useful for the queen to have a range of friends and acquaintances who could she deploy, who she can deploy as cover, excuses, or diversions in her dealings with the more powerful players, who she has a continuing, who she does have a continuing interest in. So not much more needs to be said about the pawns. But what about the queen? Well, the queen is able to assess and manage her fellow players. She can position them on the board where she wants them. This is part of feminine power coming through. She needs to maintain good relations with potential suitors in her life, as it's unlikely that she'll find one who's capable of meeting her, all her needs for the whole of her life. So if you're a midlife woman looking for more love from a new partner or an old one, then maybe you should look at the course how to find love in middle life. And I'm giving out a link, I'll, uh, I'll read it when I've got more light at the end, um, where you can go and see a video which will introduce it. Actually, it's here now. Let me try and dis decipher it. It's HTTPS and all that, bitly, which is B-I-T dot L-L-Y, 
B-I-T-L-Y, but with a dot between the bit and the Lee, forward slash find love midlife. No, find love in midlife. So if you can remember that, put in bitly, find love in midlife, that will take you to a video where I talk in much more detail and with nice big pictures of all the chess pieces and what they do and how they behave. So if I can just summarize, uh, oh, and there's another thing I want you to do. All of this is very fine and I've galloped through it. So you've only probably got a very limited feeling for these men. So I encourage you to go and look at the free video where you'll get a bit more, a lot more information. Not so much on how they behave later, but in terms of recognition, because that's the first thing. I'd like you to, on a piece of paper, make a list of all the men in your life, past and present, and against each of them, just note their main characteristics and see in, if they fit any or of the prototypes that I've talked, stereotypes that I've talked about. <coughs> there are not many who are going to be 100% like any one stereotype. They may have elements of more than one, but usually there is, as in bridge, where you have four sets of cards, but um, <coughs> when you have a hand, I think it's of 13, uh, you have a strong suit, which is the one which is probably more than half and then weaker suits right down to zero. Similarly, in these characteristics, um, their, their, their strongest suit will be the one you can observe. And having done that, you're in a position to know uh, how to handle them and how to behave with them. So second thing is, um, having made this list of men, go through and then compare them with the video and the information there. Now, if you don't have a partner or boyfriend at the moment, why not create an identity kit based on these four types of the type who would most interest you, interest you as a midlife woman um, for a potential long term relationship? I do say long term relationship because relationships for life are quite rare. If you look at the statistics, only six percent of couples actually see their golden wedding. That's 50 years. Um, sometimes they die, but much more often they split. So um, the mythology around uh, marriage and till death to us apart, sadly, is discredited by the statistics. So if you find in middle life a good relationship that lies fast five to ten years, you're doing very well. So it's quite possible that you may have more than one during the second half of your life. But be prepared for that. In fact, enjoy the game. because. Um, you don't have any of the downsides that you used to have before when choosing a partner. So I'm coming to the end now of what I want to say about love and life. I mean, I'll just go back and reiterate the most important thing and a couple of other things that come from the course. I said it's very important for women to become aware that they are have the upper hand in the game of midlife love. They have all the advantages. Um, and most men don't have all of those, don't have all of them. They may have a few, but not all. But it's important that a woman takes that control. And uh, there are things in the other parts of the program, which I talk about the midlife transition, where they can uh, exercise those other things. Money is one of them. Not being able to support yourself in middle and later life makes you vulnerable to trying to find someone else to do so. Worst case scenario, it's the state, and they're not very generous. Or you may have to, uh, well, as I said, there are not many men around with money uh, who are uh, available to you. So getting one of those things straight. But nonetheless, it's a state of mind. Once you realize that you are now no longer the suitor, uh, that they are the suitor, and you're the suited, as it were. And I, 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 the analogy which I use it here is like going for a job interview. You are the employer. You're the one who's joined up, drawn up the job description, which I just mentioned earlier. What are your ideal characteristics for the partner you're looking for? And you're interviewing the men who uh, come to you to see how closely they fit your um, your template. And the thing to bear in mind is all these men that I've talked about, the different types of men, the knight, the bishop, the rook and the king, although their characters are pretty dis dissembled, they are very capable of putting on the charm and initially convincing you that they're otherwise. That's why you have to be patient and take your time before 
uh, you allow them into your life uh, intimately um, because you may find if you find leave it till later you may find that uh, they're not all they were cracked up to be so that's an important role change and if you're involved in internet dating I can do a whole course on internet dating it's very important to take that attitude I just give you one tip from internet dating I've been on some sites and looked at how women portray themselves in the photographs let alone what they say and sadly some of them don't put even their one foot forward let alone their best foot forward and in the photographs some of them really do not do themselves credit so the thing the strategy that i recommend there is to put your best foot forward take a glammed up photograph of yourself and put that on there and take the attitude is yes i can look like that for the right person i don't look like that every day i don't want to look like that every day but that's already you taking control of that situation so my time is up and i need to draw to a close i hope that these pointers for how to do better in the game of midlife love you may be doing very well so please don't let me uh, discredit that um, but in order to do better you you need to understand what the really odds are for and against you now, this is gene mcdonald the midlife woman's mentor signing off till next time and we'll be looking at the later stages of the midlife transition so in the meantime, it's Gene McDonald, the Midlife Women's Mentor, signing off for now. Bye. I hope that you've enjoyed the show today as much as we've enjoyed making it for you. If you've got anything out of this episode, please do tell someone else how they can subscribe to the Brand Builders TV channel at youtube.com forward slash Brand Builders TV. Why not join us at our next Brand Builders Thinkubator, a global mastermind that we run every week to take away the loneliness of being in business on your own. For more information and to book your place, visit light.brandbuilders.club forward slash thinkubator. That's light.brandbuilders.club forward slash thinkubator. Until next time, be the ripple that you wish to see in the world and we'll see you soon. <laughs>